This is a more than just podcast production. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 383 of the More Than Just Code podcast. My name is Tim Mitra. I am, as usual, in Toronto, Ontario. And I'm joined today by Dave DeLong in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hey, Tim. How's it going? I'm doing really well. I know we. this is a, probably our second time having an official chat. Uh, we met in Chicago at Deep Dish. But um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Did One of my favorite sculptures is in, in uh, I think it's in the Great Salt Lake, the Spiral Jetty. Do you know that one? I am aware of the Spiral Jetty. I have not visited it myself, but it's a it's a nice place to visit. I hear. Yeah, and it kind of comes and goes. Um, I at university days I was into what they call I think it was called earth art, and they basically mm-hmm. artists were taking large pieces of earth, or they were or was one guy one um, artist I believe he just died last year who who would line rocks up for like a mile. Huh. <laughs> as he was walking, you know, kind of thing. And, and uh, Robert Smithson did the spiral jetty. And I remember seeing a film in university where he got like a bunch of front end loaders and dump trucks and these huge boulders and just went out into the lake and made this jetty. And apparently it, because of the, the lake, it comes and goes. And mm-hmm. and then, of course, the salt uh, formations inside the spiral kind of have a life of their own kind of thing. Hmm. So That's it's cool. an interesting piece to visit. So I don't know. It's it's a... Uh, I mean, it, I guess it's kind of, you know, the, as big as you can be as, as an earth artist, right? Mm-hmm. Cool. So, um, yeah, and I think Dave and I have some common history, but I, I do want to tell you that, uh, you know, I, I looked it up on our podcast. We've been doing, you know, this podcast for 10 years, and it's about mobile engineering, and, and your name has come up a lot quite over the years, the last, you know, 10 years or so. At least you've got three shout outs and for various things you were doing back in the day. Uh, I believe you were an evangelist on for Apple products from time to time, and we would have seen Correct. you. I'm pretty sure we saw you in some of the... Uh, videos on the WWC videos back in the day, right? So, yep. Yep. So, so what, what kind of areas are, I, I know you did, you studied computer science and stuff, but I mean, what kind of areas of, of, uh, mobile, our Mac development, uh, do you, do you find interest in? Um, well, so I started as a Mac developer, um, back in like 2003 or 2004, this was before I learned Objective-C. Um, I was using a language called Real Basic, now called Zojo, I think. Um, and so I've always been interested in making like little utility apps for myself and friends. And um, as I learned more languages and eventually learned Objective-C, then building apps natively on Mac has always kind of been my thing. Um, of course, I did iOS development uh, when it... When the SDK came out, um, I worked at Apple on UI Kit, and but these days I'm kind of going back to my roots, and I spend most of my time either working on frameworks or Mac apps directly. Um, I still do some iOS uh, when the need arises, but um, I find working on Mac apps to be refreshingly straightforward compared to the complexities of mobile development. So are you are you is that like an a, 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 uh, like an app kit kind of approach, or are you using um, Swift UI these days, or mostly Swift UI, but dropping to app kit when I need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess you can do some heavy lifting there, oh, more yeah. than the rest of us could, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean it's funny. I, I signed up as an app or a Mac developer when I first became a, a an Apple developer, and um, you know back when you had to pay an extra I don't know a couple hundred bucks or something to be an app yeah. a Mac developer, and um, to this day, I'm still not published a single app. <laughs> that said, I mean, like I'm getting close because because uh, I've been working with a lot with Swift Data lately, and you know, with Swift UI, and just about everything I do is going to be a multi-platform app, just because mm-hmm. why not, right? right? The only thing I don't go to is Watch or Apple TV, but you know, the the fact that you know your Swift UI app can be published on Vo- Vision Pro is obviously where I'm spending a lot of my time on Vision Pro these days, mm. and um, yeah, so the the temptation to do a Mac app is has is like just on i'm close like uh, yeah. i just recently did a um implementation of storekit 2 which allows me to use storekit on a mac which mm-hmm. you know some of those things like revenue cad and uh, things like that don't support mac so that i know of anyway so so that's kind of where i'm going these days 
Yeah. Um, so in my free time, I do a lot of um, just general framework and package development. Um, of course, I've got a package on GitHub for dealing with dates and times in Swift. Um, and for the past month or so, I've been getting into a, uh, a open specification called GTFS, the General Transit Feed Specification. Um, I've been interested in trying to come up with a better way to track the local transit agency and like figure out where buses and trains are and trip plan and things like that. Um, so I've been learning more about this. Uh, it's it's pretty crude file format. It's just a zip file of CSV files. <laughs> oh, really? I wonder <laughs> if that's is that a pretty common thing? Because I know we had a we had an app in Toronto here where I am. We had a our streetcars are called a Red Rocket, right? Mm -hmm. That's the nickname. There was and there was a, a Rocket app, which recently got um, taken off the store um, by the by the authors, but. Um, yeah, and we used, everybody used that to figure out when the transit was coming. So I wonder, is that like yeah. an open sort of standard for yeah, transit? Yeah, yeah, you can go to gtfs.org uh, and learn about it. My main interest is that while we do have transit apps for the area, mainly the transit app, um, it's an app that seems to be built largely for people who are commuting and ne need information about, uh, you know, uh, vehicles and stops in the moment. Um, and doesn't seem to be geared as much toward planning or tracking someone else as they travel. Um, so my interest is that, um, you know, one of my kids is going to a new high school this year and is using public transit to get there. And we've had situations where, you know, there's traffic or buses are delayed or whatever, and we're trying to help them get to school on time and work with stuff. So like as a parent helping your child, like, an app that is built for commuters isn't just isn't the sort of thing that I'm looking for. Um, so being a programmer, I look to see can I solve this myself and just yeah. I mean, why well, I, I hear you because I mean uh, that I, I personally I've you know tried to plan like occasionally I'll, I'll we have a, a commuter train here called Go Train and occasionally I'll want to go at random times to another city and rather than get, sit on the highway you know with my car which I don't I always have. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to sort of figure out if you're not doing the daily commute thing where where the yeah. which train to catch or when to be at the stop and yep. so on and so forth. It's frustrating. Cool. So when and I, I'm kind of curious about the gen about frameworks. I don't think I've ever heard anybody. I mean, beyond the people at Code Code that I hang out with, who specifically say I I'm doing frameworks. So what can you explain to my listeners what that would entail? Why would you do that? Yeah. Um, so for a lot of developers, they get a thrill out of building an app for other people to use. And they get a kick out of polishing the app and making sure the user experience is as good as they can get it. Um, and then putting it on the store for others to use. Um, I have that, but targeting other developers. Um, so for me, I get a lot of satisfaction out of constructing a really refined API. Um, that exposes complex uh, ideas in a straightforward way um, that is, you know, hopefully simple to use and solves the majority of uh, typical use cases in a way that with minimal fuss. Um, so as I build frameworks, um, I look at things for like, you know, what are the common usage patterns? How do I think this should be used? Um, how much work can I take off the integrator's plate um, so that, you know, can I get this massively complex idea down to just like two or three lines of code? Um, you know, how do you name things so that it guides people towards correct usage? How do you use type safety and compiler hints to guide people uh, on the way that they should go? Um, I find those sorts of problems to be very satisfying to solve. Yeah, and it's interesting. Well, it's, it's, on a side note, I was chatting with uh, a colleague that I'm, I'm on a thing called Swift Remote Studio where indie developers get together and we have like a, it's a Slack channel, we can chat and we have a coffee call in the middle of the week and we have a goals meeting at the end of, on the Friday. And I had mentioned that one of, I put down on my list of goals I was going to interview you today and uh, one of them said, you know, I've probably got Dave DeLong's code in a number of my apps, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 
And I've seen your I've seen your your uh, your GitHub stuff on on uh, the date thing you talk about. I forget what it's mm-hmm. called. But I mean that was it. I mean we like when I went back and listened to the three episodes where your name got dropped by one of my co-hosts. It was usually with respect to some framework or, or idea you were putting out there, which was really mm-hmm. kind of cool. So yeah. And the other thing that we talked about at uh, Chicago, you did a good talk on. Um, being an advocate for the community, right? So maybe you right. can sort of tell, give the the ten minute spiel and sort of the five minute spiel on on being a meetup guy. Sure. Um, so, you know, f- uh, wow, fifteen plus years ago, I think, uh, when I was in college, uh, or sixteen or seventeen years ago, um, the iPhone had just come out. I had connected with a couple other app uh, Apple. Uh, users in the computer science department at my university. Um, And we were all interested in trying to find ways to use Objective-C as part of our coursework. Um, Usually the professors would say, you know, you can do this project in any language you want. And most people would choose Java because that was the language the the department had largely standardized on. Um, But me being, you know, a bit of a masochist and trying to see, you know, how complicated can I make things? I wanted to do it in Objective-C. Um, so I connected with a couple other friends and we decided, you know, let's start a club around this because there's a Mac users group on campus. Um, maybe we can find other people who are doing this too. So we started a university club, um, and we started doing monthly meetings and started building a little momentum. And then we added in what, uh, is called NS coder night. And that was just a weekly casual hangout. And we would meet at a, like a local drink shop and, uh, for a couple hours in the evening and just talk and help each other through um, homework problems or work problems or whatever it was. Um, over time, this group has grown quite a bit. Um, we're now called the Utah Developers Organization, and our online Slack community is over 900 people. Our meetup is over uh, meetup group is over 900 people. We run over 60 meetup events a year. Uh, between just like casual hangouts and monthly presentations. Um, It's a lot of work. It can be really exhausting sometimes, Um, but I also find it really rewarding. Um, It keeps me connected with people in my life, just like forcing me to get out and interact with folks. Um, I've made tons of great friends. Uh, We do events that are unrelated to coding um, because of this group. Um, it's great for networking and job hunting and referrals. Um, we've got uh, channels in our Slack group where we help each other with, you know, you know, dealing with home ownership problems or, you know, finding referrals for like, you know, some guy needs an electrician who you got, uh, things like that. It's been a lot of work, but it's been a extremely, extremely valuable to me. So I, I work really hard to keep it going. Um, it's an important part of my life and I hope it continues to be. Yeah, it seems pretty, pretty uh, successful. Um, I've sent a couple of people your way that I found out were in your neighborhood, but mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if they, they showed up or whatever, but, uh, yeah. And we, I mean, I'm part of a group here in Toronto. We did the same thing where, you know, when I started out similar story, um, I was interested in this thing. I had a couple of customers come to me saying they wanted an app. I had to figure out, okay, now what do I do? Yeah. You know, so I had to find people to help me with that. And, and um, eventually one of the contractors I had hired said, hey, we have this group in Toronto called TACO, which is it was, it's Toronto area, uh, TACO is Toronto area, Cocoa Heads mm-hmm. and Web Objects. But they took the oh, okay. web, web Objects and flipped it around to OW, right? So, uh, and I think we, I, I want to say we still have one guy who's now working for Apple full time, but he was one, one of our guys was a web objects guy right up till a few years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is surprisingly, you know, like, uh, I guess a lot of people are, are, are surprised to hear that it's still, still going, there yep. is a, a network out there, but there's people writing for Newton these days too, right? Mm-hmm. So who knows? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I spoke about this community app at Deep Dish Swift and shared some of my experiences with uh, getting a community going, um, finding places to meet, encouraging others to attend. Um, Like, it it sounds really impressive to hear that, like, oh, wow, there's this group and, like, a thousand people in it sort of thing. Um, But, you know, honestly, we have meetups where, like, four people come. 
Um, and our, our quote unquote big monthly meetups, like maybe we'll get 20. Um, so it, like, it sounds really impressive, but it's, it's just a lot of consistent work of showing up and eventually people start to congregate and some will come, some will go. It's a, it's always, it's an ongoing project. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, our experience too. Is, is a large number of people who have signed up, and then yeah, I mean even even with the Swift Remote Studio, which I mentioned earlier, um, I think there's there's hundreds of us in there, and but there's six of us that show up every day, every right. week, right? <laughs> right. With our, some of us with our Vision Pro in our Vision Pro, Pro personas as well. I tend to put mine on just because I find it easier to use Zoom with a with a Vision <laughs> Pro. Uh, let me ask you that. So so um, in terms of hardware, like, are you have you looked at vision pro are you into it or um i have a vision pro um it's currently a device i use exclusively for entertainment um it's really phenomenal for watching tv and movies um it's not something i've integrated into like my personal development or workflow um all of the places I would use it in that sort of regard, like I've already got it, got them set up to my satisfaction. Like I've got screens and keyboards and, you know, my laptop here and it hasn't felt compelling enough to, to make the switch to vision pro. Um, like I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm very much a Mac guy at heart. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, for me, it's it's the same thing. It's like consuming just about anything mm -hmm. in 3D if I can, if I, like a movie or whatever. Mm -hmm. I watch all the Prime and HBO and Max and all that kind of stuff on there. All the Apple TV stuff, obviously. Yep. Um, but I, I mean, I have a, a MacBook 13 that I use, um, 13 Air, and um, I also have a small puppy. So I'm often in the kitchen for like the last 10 months I've been in the kitchen. And uh, so for me, using the Vision Pro to get the bigger screen and getting, you know, getting more things, more windows mm -hmm. going has been something I bought into, right? So I probably use it every day, surprisingly, but wow. yeah. And then, like I said, it's just faster for me. If I, want, if I want to join a Zoom for half an hour, just throw it on and I can continue. I can make my lunch. I can, you know, be outside. I can do whatever. And, and you know, because you just see my persona, you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, right? So yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of a, it's, I guess it's a, it's an interesting thing. And, and I'm kind of curious, like, I mean, I've been around AR and VR, XR, if you want to call it that for years and never really found anything that that's compelling enough. And it's yeah. funny, I was watching uh, the latest uh, Rings of Power on Prime last night thinking to myself, you know, these windows are so real. Mm -hmm. That you know, I think it's it, they've done a phenomenal job in terms of in terms of making me believe that I'm really looking at a large screen when I'm just looking at something in front of my eyes, right? Yeah, I had the opportunity to try a prototype of the Vision Pro uh, at Apple, and it was I was in California visiting for some work meetings and stuff, and after hours, uh, one of the guys said, you know, let's go over to the to the Vision Pro Lab and check out the devices because. We knew about the project. We were working on stuff related to it, so we could we could go over. We did, and I went over, and I was really excited, and I could tell my heart rate was elevated and everything. Um, and I remember sitting down and putting it on, and doing like the whole you know enrollment for guest stuff. Look at the dots and click your fingers. Um, and then I just dialed up the I think it was the Yosemite environment, and I could feel my blood pressure drop. Like just the, the, the serenity of being in this incredibly immersive environment, uh, all of the, the rest of the, the room faded out, the people faded out, everything around me. And it was just me in nature. And it was, it was incredible. And that was the instant I decided, like, I don't care what this costs when it comes out, I'm buying one. <laughs> um, well yeah, I mean, it was a similar experience for me. People who have listened to the show are going to hear the story. Oh, here he goes again. But, um, you know, I went down, I got invited to Apple. You know, I signed, I, I, I applied for the, the uh, privilege to go to one of the first labs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went down with a complete skeptical. I've seen some pretty janky stuff come out of Apple in the past, you know. And my, my room, as you can see, is littered with Apple stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, I... You know, I, and I, like I said, I've been around the block. I've seen VR, XR. I've been doing 3D for, you know, 20 years now. And I was 
I had I had done a painting in university of these cubes floating in space, and I read that Dave Smith, David underscore Smith, had had put a list of things he wanted to try on the on the device. So I thought, oh, okay, that's a good idea. So I I made a list, mm -hmm. and one of the things was I just went into Re Reality Composer Pro and put these cubes on the screen and colored them the same way I had done in the painting, and I forgot about it. And then you know, but I had taken a fourteen foot shark and had it circling my desk at the <laughs> in the lab, which was really kind of cool. And then, um, yeah, near the end of the day, because at the labs you have like f almost five hours to just play, right? And um, I hope I remembered. I, oh, I forgot this app, and I opened it up and just see like the smile on my face. You couldn't have wiped it off because mm -hmm. just seeing these this image realized that I had done like thirty five, forty years ago, you know, uh, real real. And I just I actually opened it the other day in, in the kitchen just for fun, but. Um, yeah, and I, I had to get up and un, untether myself and and walk around the room and just look at this this thing because mm -hmm. I mean that was a other thing they encouraged us to do was to get up from your desk and and walk around with the device on right. So I don't know if you had like the I mean I've heard stories of I think I read an article by Tim Cook uh, or an interview with him where when he first saw it it was like you know <laughs> an old computer like the you know the it took a room mm -hmm. to make the device kind of thing but i don't know i guess you were pretty close to the to the what you kind of eventually yeah, saw yeah it was it was basically final form factor oh okay cool yeah 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 it, no it's it's a fun fun device i mean yeah, yeah. but i yeah. mean it, it, and then and it has its naysayers but that's i i will be very interested to see where this technology goes um like there are some incredibly obvious applications for it. Um, the, in my mind, like the, the big, the big hurdle it needs to overcome is power. Um, how does it get enough power to operate for extended periods of time? Um, because like Apple's phenomenal at miniaturization of components. Um, uh, I mean, look at these, you know, 4k screens that are like in, inch inch and a half across it's it's incredible with all of the other technology crammed into there um and you've got this massive power brick you have to carry around um and it, and so like if if we can if we humans can figure out like how to do better energy storage denser energy storage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then things get really interesting well i mean apple's done a phenomenal job with batteries i mean if you look at what they've mm -hmm. done in the phones and even ipod ipods and macs these days yeah um you know, the fact that we only have to carry around this little iphone like you know box with us i well i jokingly envision you know somebody on amazon coming out with a little uh, you know, like a suitcase you drag around behind you in the airport with a big battery pack in it. Yeah. <laughs> and you just drag that with you wherever you go, right? <laughs> but I've seen people, you know, atta attach to the back of their head or maybe somebody mm -hmm. comes up with a backpack with ba battery in it or something. Yeah. I mean, I know when I've traveled, I, I carry a second battery with me just because, you know, mm -hmm. you never know. And I've actually, uh, I've actually used a phone charger to keep it running. So, uh, like, you know, one of those little power bricks, right? Yep. Um yeah, it is an interesting, interesting conundrum. But, you know, and I've been telling people that for me, because Apple's now figured out it's the OS for me is, is the fantastic part. The fact that they can mm -hmm. trick my mind into thinking I'm seeing a window that's really yeah. in front of me when, in fact, it's not. Right. Yep. Or I'm sitting in I'm sitting at Mount Hood looking at, you know, the mountains or you're somebody like you mentioned. Right. But. Um, I envision a day when, when there's a chip that gets stuck in the back of your ear or behind your ear there and a little plate that they, you know, surgically put in there. And that's, you know, the Vision OS runs inside your head. You don't mm -hmm. need hardware then. Well, you need a little, you know, something small, but, you know, <laughs> that's well, kind of where I see it coming. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like the the Ready Player One kind of concept too. They're mm -hmm. already, they've already, I mean, Disney demonstrated a floor where you can walk, yeah. and uh, you stand you're standing in in, um, in place, and as you move your feet, the the roll the balls underneath you move, and if you turn, they turn with you and that kind of stuff. So that's, you know, we're getting close. We just need the mm -hmm. haptic suit, and and uh, <laughs> your kid won't have to go to school anymore. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> We proved all that with Zoom, but okay. Well, let, let's let's switch gears in, and, and we're just on the cusp of uh, well, we're on the cusp of, of the iPhone announcement, I think, on Monday, right? But mm -hmm. um, where do you think uh, what you know, what you know, what you can say? Where do you think uh, we're going with with equipment these days? I mean, obviously, I think uh, um, 
an obvious thing would be shooting spatial video on a on a phone of some type. Seems like a no brainer, but uh, yeah, that's that's in. Uh, I'll be blunt and say I don't know. Um, I've got some things that I would love to see come out of Apple. Um, there are a lot of rumors around a Mac Mini redesign. Um, one of the things I would love to see is like how like could you cram a Mac Mini into something the size of an iPhone? Mm, right. Um, like, could I have a full Mac computer that I just carry around in my pocket that's got, like, a Thunderbolt port, maybe two, um, that I can, like, click into a dock and I've got everything with me wherever I go? Because, like, you know, I wouldn't need a screen, I wouldn't need a battery. Um, could I, you know, use something like that as a simpler home server uh, than than having a Mac mini on a shelf. Um, I would love to see something like that. Um, in terms of phones, not really sure. I've got any particular insights or requests for phones. I'm a little tired of the camera bump. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I would be totally fine with a thicker iPhone and and no camera bump. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, it's, uh, I don't know. It's hard to say anything that I'm like missing from hardware, just because, you know, I'm, I've got the way that I use my hardware. It works for me. It meets my needs, and it's it's hard to imagine what I'm missing until I see it. Yeah. Well, it, you know, speaking of the going back to the idea you had there, I'm pretty sure we we talked about this on the show once, and I used it as a short. But there was a patent, I think, and I think it was by Apple. Where it was a, it was like a Mac laptop with a gap in it about the size mm-hmm. of a phone, and the actual CPU and everything, the memory and RAM and all that. And this is going back like four or five years ago, so it seemed like a long, you know, long yeah. way off. And if you look at the size of the 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 motherboard inside of a Mac or a current Mac, they're really small. They're tiny. Yeah. yeah, so there's there's no um, reason why you couldn't do that, right? Apple has another patent for essentially a hollow studio display, mm-hmm. uh, or a, a, a display with like a big old slot on the side. And the the idea behind the patent is that you would walk up and slide your computer into the right. display to dock it, and right. the display would take over uh, the 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 contents of your machine. Um, and I think about that a lot, especially when it comes to uh, iPads. Um, but mm-hmm. it would work this sort of work really well with this kind of, uh, you know, portable Mac mini as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess a portable one. Yeah. But I think you're, I think you're, cause I had heard the, I think M4 Mac mini was kind of what people were talking about. Was it M3? Mm-hmm. I can't remember, but Is it, I'm yeah. actually waiting for the next, I, I've, I've got a MacBook air M1 that I've, I'm currently rocking and, uh, um, I'm looking for the next, you know, whatever the next iteration of 14 inch would be, right? Hopefully, mm-hmm. M4, um, because I'm running into, I get, I get run into blocks all the time if I'm running Xcode and got a bunch of things going, and I get the, you run out of memory on your machine, and <laughs> I'm never buying a Mac with less than two terabytes of space on it <laughs> for yeah. that reason, and and you know anything less than like you know 24 megs of RAM or gigs of RAM, I guess. You know, but mind you, I, uh, you can't. Well, you can't see it on the shelf. I got a uh, my. I'm trying to look at my finger there. That is my my original two CX. Okay. With uh, eight eight, uh, but it's been updated to thirty two megs of RAM, mm. and a, and a whopping eighty megabyte hard drive. Right. So nice. <laughs> that's where I started. <laughs> yeah, uh, I grew up using a two CI. My mm-hmm. dad had a Mac XL. Mm-hmm. Kind of like the Lisa, but that ran Mac OS. Right, right. Um, I had a Power Mac 7200 in high school that I like to uh, shop around, like Sonnet for mm-hmm. hardware upgrades. Right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I eventually got up to like a five gigabyte SCSI external drive, and I felt so cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting the the where we've come from. And it's funny cuz the SE30 behind me, I um mm-hmm. it's the power supply died a couple of weeks ago, but I got to replace that. But um uh I hadn't used a Mac like that in a long long time and I, I hooked it all up, got it all refer I rechipped it and the motherboard and all that kind of stuff and uh then I realized, oh yeah, I forgot. We didn't really have any other than floppy disks. We didn't have any way of getting things from one to another, right? So, mm-hmm. or a modem or whatever, right? So, 
Yeah. Yeah, there was Long like way. the old Apple Talk protocol you could use mm-hmm. for computer to computer communication. Yeah. But it was pretty finicky. Yeah, we uh, we we worked with that for a long time. In fact, I think I have some of those Asante local talk to Ethernet adapters somewhere, mm-hmm. just, yep. just so, on a shelf, just waiting for a need. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because all these old Macs, the ones behind me, they have trouble uh, getting on the web now because the Safaris that are on them don't understand HTTPS. And oh. the whole world, only Apple seems to be, Apple and Google are the only two companies that seem to, to be able to serve anything that's for anything that, that doesn't understand the protocol, right? Hmm. So lots of fun. Cool. Um, yeah, well, let's let's uh, let's go back in time. So I'm kind of curious to sort of get a background on you, like, when did the spark become a computer engineer or when like you mentioned your dad with his yep. mac excel like how did how did you discover computers what was your first experience with them like um so i grew up using computers um you know playing around with uh, claris works uh on school computers um we had apple works on our home computers Um, but it wasn't until like, uh, 10th grade in high school, I was just like 14 or 15 where I actually got interested in programming. Um, and that was entirely my math teacher's fault. (laughs) Um, I was taking trigonometry that year and I just got really, really tired of applying the law of sines and law of cosines over and over again. And I thought, you know, I've got this little graphing calculator here. Maybe I can make it do it for me. Because I had a, other little apps on my graphing calculator. Um, so I dug out the manual and I started reading through, like, how do you ask for a number? How do you print something out? How do you do math? When um, I spent the entire school year building out a program for my graphing calculator to do my trigonometry homework for me. <laughs> um, and... I ended up learning trig way better than I would have if I had just done my homework myself. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I, it's funny. I used to, used to, you know, the old cheat sheet. Too. You'd sit down yeah. and you'd spend a week writing the cheat sheet, and then you realize I just taught myself the stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so it was from there that I got into actual app programming because I thought, oh, well, now I've done this on a graphing calculator. Let's do this for my Mac. Um, so I got real basic. I think I went to like Macworld Boston or something one year and, and picked it up there. Um, my, one of the best birthday presents I got from my dad was my own copy of my own license to BB edit. Uh, I was like BB edit four or something. Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, when I went to college, I was originally going to be a mechanical engineering student. Um, based on some other stuff I'd done as a teenager. Um, But I got into those classes and I just realized very quickly it was not for me. Um, So I decided to drop out of mechanical engineering and took some computer science classes just because I'd done programming before and so I'll just pick something and, you know, do that until I figure out what I really want to do. And it turns out that was what I really wanted to do. So I did a computer science degree and graduated with a bachelor's. And then a few months after that, went to work for Apple. Yeah, I'm a big BB Edit fan. In fact, I was using it about an hour ago myself, right? (laughs) It's one of those apps that just never quits. I love love the uh, containers now that I can just, I use it as a sketch pad. I just, you know, post Mm. some code in there and then leave it and never have to save it, come back to it. and Yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorite apps for sure. That and and like I'm a I'm an old school Unix editor, so I use Ed as my as my mm. uh, my you know single line editor. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I didn't even, never even got into VI or anything like that. Like, um, yeah, because I never can remember how to quit VI. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but cool. All right. Well, you know, we have like I said, I have this section of the of the interview where I'll switch the gears and just ask you some random questions, and they're based okay. on the Marcel Proust questionnaire. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but, uh, Mm -hmm. and then some of them are Stephen Colbert questions. So, and it's just a way of peeling back the, the onion and getting to know you. So if you're seated comfortably, we can begin. All right. I'm ready. All right. So the first one is, this is actually a Marcel Proust question question. And what is your motto? Um, I have a couple different ones. Um, when it comes to writing code, my personal motto that that is for myself and I do not advocate for others, but my motto there is 
anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Uh, from the point of view of like, you know, why spend 10 minutes doing something by hand when I can spend five hours automating it? Um, <laughs> well, you only have to do it once after that, right? Right. Um, so when it, when I write code for myself, I usually tend to go overboard. Um, so that's a personal motto I have. It's, I share it with others in jest because it's, it's not very good advice. No, no. Um, the, the one that I share with my kids is, uh, the, the blunt form of it is evolve or die. Mm, okay. Um, and the nicer form is improvise, adapt and overcome. Um, you know, stuff comes up and you can either figure out how to deal with it or just let it consume you. Right. <laughs> and that's, okay. that's kind of about it. All right, cool. Um, who are your heroes in real life? Mm. Um, I have a hard time answering this question just because of like... Um, Personal experience has taught me to be very distrustful of the idea of putting people up on pedestals. Um, I have people whose work I admire, um, but I'm not sure I would consider them heroes. Um, so some people whose work I admire um, in the tech world, um, I'm probably going to get his name wrong, but, uh, Cinder Sorhus, um, I've never heard his name pronounced. That's just how I see it. Um, I am incredibly impressed by the ideas that he has and the amount of quality code that he can put out. And it's, mm -hmm. he's got some packages on his GitHub that I just keep going back to over and over again. Interesting. Um, yeah. Um, I'd say Rich Siegel is in there, mm, yeah. uh, the creator of BB Edit. Um, Rich is a fantastic human human being, um, writes great software, um, and I admire him and what he does. I think he's got cool hobbies. He does uh, KitchenAid mixer restoration as a really? hobby. Hmm. Um, okay. And I just think that's really cool. It's fun to see... Um, you know, this this person that you know for a very specific reason just have really fascinating interests outside of that. Um, that'd be another example. Um, there's uh, an author who lives not too far from me named Brandon Sanderson. Um, I really admire his work ethic. Uh, he's known as a very prolific author, but when you get down to it, um, he, yeah, he writes a lot, but really what he does is he's consistent in how he writes. Um, he writes, you know, a couple hours every day, gets, you know, two or 3,000 words a day, and that's good, but he does that every single day. Mm -hmm. And so, like, by the end of the year, he's just written hundreds of thousands of words, you know, the equivalent of two or three full-length novels every year. And he just does that every day because he likes writing in the same way that I like writing code. I just, I, I have to do it. Um, right. So yeah, cool. there's some right. examples. Here's a, here's a twisty question. What is the best sandwich? Oh, I think I'm going to have to say an authentic Philly cheesesteak. Okay. And what, what can you explain to the listeners what that is? Um, so that's, let's see. Well, the, I guess the Philly cheesesteak I like is, you know, Toasted uh, bread with the meat, the really gooey cheese, and then some peppers in there. And yeah. it's served hot and drippy and messy, and it's it just hits all the right pleasure centers of my brain. <laughs> of just, you know, carbohydrates and fat and protein, and it's just, it's perfect. What's your favorite action movie? Um... Speed Racer. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent one that just came out a few yeah, years ago? Yeah, the one the Wachowskis did. Right. Um, uh, with Emil Hirsch and Christina Ricci. Um, that, to me, is one of the most visually perfect movies hmm. I've ever seen. 
um, when I got my Vision Pro, that was the first movie I watched on it. The very first thing I watched on it was Speed Racer. Um, it is pure eye candy. It's a good story. It's in many ways a bit of a tropey story. It you know hits all of the the, the typical storytelling tropes, um, but just the visuals of it and the music and it all combines into. Uh, I think just a really fabulous movie. Did you watch it, the show when you were like the animated show when you were a kid or not really maybe an no? episode here or there when it was on Saturday morning cartoons or whatever. But okay. I didn't ask you like uh, when you were talking about growing up, did you grow up in Utah? Uh, no, I grew up in Southern California um, okay. uh, in Orange County. And then when I was 13, my parents moved us to Rhode Island, uh, mm. which is where I claim my home it's the home of my heart right okay so i was going to ask like the, the question is where would you like most like to live um i dream a lot about moving back to new england um although colorado and washington are pretty high up on my list uh mm. if i could afford it uh vancouver canada mm -hmm. uh, i cannot afford it <laughs> um, but these are all places. Yeah, these are all places that I love to visit. I love the uh, the combination of or just like how close you are to nature, and especially the kind of nature I like. I like forests. Um, I like lots of trees. I live in a desert. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, what's your favorite word? Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, let me ask this one. What words or phrases do you overuse? Um, my kids would probably say something that I really overdo dad jokes, especially the, <laughs> the high blank, I'm dad. Um, they say I'm tired and they say, hi, tired, I'm dad. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's, I was going to say a, you got to give you got to give me some dad jokes now that you've you've gone down that road. Oh man. Uh they they're usually just top of my head puns like this the bottom of the barrel, you know, what can I say immediately for the quickest laugh. Mm, um mm. Yeah. Okay. What's the scariest animal? Spiders. Spiders? Yeah. Any particular spiders in particular or all of them? Um Anything that uh, is larger than, I don't know, an eighth of an inch. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a little red one that size today. Actually, uh, more, yeah. I mean, like a, a really tiny one, I can kill myself, but anything larger than like, um, say like a quarter. Um, yeah, I'm just not dealing with that. Right. Okay, cool. So a couple of quick ones, flat or sparkling? Uh, flat. Okay. Uh, apples or oranges? Apples. Cats or dogs? Um, dogs. Okay. Um, window or aisle? Ooh. It, it depends on a whole bunch of things, but in general, I usually choose aisle. Mm hmm Okay. Um, what number am I thinking of? 42. Oh, we're so close. But no, it wasn't <sighs> that one. <laughs> um, uh, what's your favorite smell? Um, probably a combination of like fur and pine trees. Okay. Um, Star Wars or Star Trek? Probably Star Trek. Okay. Any reason why or... Um, it's a more hopeful story. Oh, okay. Right. Um, what's the most used app on your phone? Uh, probably messages. Messages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a dream that you can remember? Um, like the main, so I generally don't dream. The main dream I do remember is like my childhood nightmare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does it come back or you just remember that particular one? Um, I have it maybe once a decade. Really? Um, okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I had one when I was like six or seven and I, I can't forget it. But, yep. Uh, yep. Um, you only get to listen to one song for the rest of your life. What is it? 
Ooh, probably Strobe by Dead Mouse. Okay. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, all right. Well, uh, let me see. I've got one more question I can ask you. Um, I'm trying to avoid some of the ones I think you won't answer. <laughs> um, we asked you that one already. Who's your favorite hero of fiction? Or your favorite fictional character, if you want. My favorite fictional character? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so I've been rereading the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson right now. Um, and there are a lot of really great characters in there, but one of the ones that I think is the most mercurial and therefore the most fascinating to me uh, is a character named Shallan. Um, I'd say right now she's probably my favorite just because of how complicated she is. Um, actually, I did have I should have asked your core data question. Ah. So I'm kind of I'm kind of working on. So I, I have this really old app that I started in 2010, mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm I'm currently rewriting it for Swift Data, but but because people have it in their hands today in the original form, um, I just was playing around with a few updates on it, and um, I've, I've turned it. I've changed the monetization from a pipe by, by once. Now it's going to be using subscriptions, but uh, I looked at adding cloud kit to it years ago back when mm. the the bad cloud kit right but lately because i've been writing a lot of swift data so uh, apps have turned on to using cloud kit right mm -hmm. so um i'm actually wrestling right now with trying to uh and this is it's primarily written in objective c with some swift in it for new things but um and actually swift ui as well but um I'm trying to figure out how to turn on or give people the ability to turn on cloud kit syncing because the way I handle images, I didn't handle them correctly. I have to actually figure out how to make a CK record and mm -hmm. share them mm -hmm. outside of core data. But, um, I'm just wondering, like, I think what I'm trying to do, I think, you know, how you have to set the, um, the store, uh, the ID of the store that you're going to put them on cloud cloud yeah kit yeah yeah your container id if i turn that to nil if they opt out i wonder if that would work oh there's a thumb reaction just <laughs> <laughs> um probably i think the cloud kit configuration happens when you're setting up the persistent store yeah so i think turning it off would probably manifest as migrating to a different persistent store oh really um and that's if you were using the core data cloud kit pairing. Mm -hmm. um, it's totally possible to do core data by yourself and then do cloud kit by yourself. Um, oh, okay. Mm. Um, and th that's how they originally were. Um, if I were doing stuff, that's probably how I would do it. Mainly because, um, not that I don't like, don't trust the cl the core data code, but like when things go wrong. And it's it's easy for you know networking syncing stuff to go wrong. Then I want visibility into why it's happening, and I want uh, uh, the ability to take action to remedy it. Um, so I would pr I would probably be doing something like uh, setting up an uh, an object that's observing changes to my core data store, and then pulling out changes and turning them into cloud kit stuff, and then Maybe, depending on your deployment target, it sounds like it's kind of back there because you're still using Objective-C and stuff, but like um, there's a new thing in CloudKit called the CK Sync Engine. Um, so if all of your stuff is private data stored in the user's private database, then you could use the Sync Engine for that. Um, and that's like CloudKit provided code for figuring out like what record should you download, do you need to upload anything, uh, and so on. Um, and if you're deploying to something older, then you could essentially be running the queries and save operations yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm think. Yeah. I did look at that earlier today, um, or yesterday, I guess. Uh, but I didn't. I wasn't sure if that was something I could tie into because, like, yeah, I'm. I've actually just managed to to update the to use the um, NS persistent store configuration thing uh, or whatever. Yeah, persistent I, container. Yeah, instead of what I was doing before, I just I just like last night updated that. <laughs> uh huh. 
which was a you know like considering it's a, a what a 14 year old app yeah um was quite an accomplishment but you know pat on the back you know <laughs> mm-hmm. but i i'm loving the fact that i can i can uh if I use the same IDs uh, on the back end and use the same data store, I can actually run the Objective C code and then switch over to a, to the Swift data code, and I'm not I'm still reading and mm-hmm. writing from the same store. Yeah. So eventually there'll be an update, you know, like a 2.0 update where it'll be Swift data instead of Objective C yeah. and Swift UI. Because I haven't played around too much with Swift data. Um, there are some aspects of it that seem nice. Um, being able to declare models in code, for example, seems nice. Um, however, uh, it's, it's just core data under the hood, like a, right under the, under the surface. Um, and I'm comfortable enough with core data and I've got enough of my own code written around it, um, which is on GitHub now that I'm not at Apple, um, that, uh, I don't find the need to to do anything else. Like I've got full layers that I've written on top of core data where, you know, I can write my own. So like I, I maintain a distinction between like the, the model class that core data uses for persistence and versus the in-memory representation. Uh, and my in-memory representations are all Swift structs uh, and they can define like how they're fetched, how they're filtered and sorted, all this stuff. And then I've written essentially uh, fetched results controller sorts of things for those structs uh, that integrate with Swift UI and everything so that in my app, I'm dealing with these Swift structs that I can prove are read only, uh, mm-hmm. that don't have to deal with faulting or anything. Right. Um, and it all feels a whole lot nicer. I've still got some grunt work in order to like connect the layers for new structs, but Overall, I find it to be a much more straightforward experience. Cool. I'll definitely have to look at your your GitHub stuff to get some some mm-hmm. ideas. I, I'm pretty sure I've looked at some of your stuff in the past on Stack Overflow and those places yeah. like that, <laughs> and yeah. on IS folks. That that's all buried in a in a repository I have called Extended Swift. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is like my repository of everything that I've added to Swift and the Apple system frameworks in order to make things nicer for me. Nice. Um, cool. So. Yeah, if you can, if you've got questions, feel free to hit me up in Slack sure. somewhere. Sure, yeah, we'll do that sometime. Okay, cool. Well, I guess we can wrap up here. Um, so, I guess before we go, uh, where can people find find you? Get in touch with you. What are you working on? Yeah. Um, so, the links to all of the ways to contact me are on my website, davedelong.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on Mastodon. Um, I can sometimes be found lurking on Reddit, but Mastodon is best. Um, I've got stuff on my website, links to my videos. I mentioned the the stuff from Deep Dish Swift. There are links to those on there as well. Um, and then uh, all of my code that I've published is on GitHub. Uh, again, linked to from my website. Cool. All right. Well, um, and so can you just, what's your, your handle on Mastodon? Um, it is Dave DeLong at mastodon.social. Cool. All right. Cool. And my name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A. On, I'm going to say on, I'm not going to say on X anymore because I'm trying to, avoid, I'm boycotting X these days. Uh, so Mastodon, Instagram, mm-hmm. on most of the places like that. But, uh, and, yep. and yeah, if you had to get a hold of me on, on X, you can, but I'm not looking at it. I'm, I've turned off the notifications. Um, cool. And uh, that's it. And so until next time, we'll see you in the future. This has been another episode of the More Than Just Code podcast. If you want to find out more about the show, you can visit the More Than Just Code website at mtjc.fm. There you can find a summary and show notes of each episode. We list links to the apps, code, and news that we mentioned on the show. If you like the podcast, tell your friends. Please leave a comment on the website, and if you can, please write a review on iTunes. And please recommend us in your favorite podcatcher. All of these things help others find out about the show. We really appreciate your help with spreading the word. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. So use the hashtag AskMTJC. Once again, the podcast Twitter account is at MTJC underscore podcast. Please consider supporting the show by pledging any amount on patreon.com slash MTJC. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.